invite you to pray with me, please. Gracious God, I thank you for this day and for our gathering here this morning, for the opportunity especially to spend some time in your word. And as we reflect on this word, may we carry with us this great wish that in this word we hear spoken to us as the choir just sang for us the whisper of our name, telling us that we're welcome at your table and worthy of the life that you offer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, our theme today is worship for our message. In particular, what makes right worship? What makes proper worship? I find it apropos or ironic that the microphones are not working <laughs> on a day when we're talking about what makes worship proper. Of course, it's not about the microphones as we'll, we'll get into, but what does make worship right? What makes worship proper? If you were to go to the Holy Land and visit one of the holy sites, and by that is meant the place where something important biblically took place, you would have to stand in line. Sometimes for a long time. You are not the only one who wants to see this important place. In many cases, a church, often by the Crusaders, has been built over the site where this wonderful thing happened. And so while you're waiting in line, you're waiting inside of a sanctuary, such as the case at the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. The place, the church built over the site where Jesus is said to have been born. The people that are waiting in line with you are not waiting in, an, in a calm, orderly fashion necessarily. They're people from all over the world, so they're chattering away in their own languages. And everybody's impatient and anxious, and so there's pushing and pulling and jockeying for position in line. It's probably hot outside and inside. There's no AC. That means that people in line with you are sweaty and smelly. It's a combination of BO and centuries, literally, of incense seeping out of the pores of the stones on the walls. And finally, you make your way up to the front, and the end is in sight. And you see over the people's shoulder in front of you that what is there on the ground is a star right there on the stone of the earth. That is the place where the manger is said to have stood, where the baby Jesus was laid when he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. And you see people coming up <coughs> to that place, that star, and they're kneeling in front of it. And they're prostrating, laying on the ground in front of it, and they're touching it, <coughs> excuse me, and they're kissing it, and they're crying and wailing above it. Is that worship? Is that right worship? Is that worthy, proper worship? 20 years ago, I spent the summer in Russia living in a village and helping to restore an ancient cathedral. And along with that work, we would spend three days a week worshiping in Russian Orthodox churches. Russian Orthodox churches are extravagantly ornate. Icons, sometimes giant icons everywhere, up on the top of the wall, on the small pillars around the outside of the octagonal church building. The language was Church Slavonic, which is an ancient form of Russian, which, of course, I didn't understand. Church services were long, and when I say long, I mean long. <laughs> Two hours at the lowest end, four hours long at the upper end. No pews, no chairs. Standing 
all the time. Now, I found that there would be a crowd that would crowd around the altar where the priests were in their uh, regal vestments leading the liturgy. And I found, as somebody who admits, admits to you here that this, these services could be a little boring after hour three, I found that I could wedge myself between two people and without them knowing it, they were propping me up and I could close my eyes and <laughs> take a cat nap standing up. But what was happening outside of the altar area, all around the outside of the church, was all kinds of activity. At any given time during this four-hour service, somebody might just get up and walk over to an icon on the wall <laughs> And they would bow repeatedly and genuflect in grand majestic fashions. And they would chant and there would be candles and they'd light a candle in front of the icon and move on to the next one and so on. Is that worship? Is that proper worship? Genuflecting, bowing, chanting, candles. That's much different than the worship I encountered in Centralia, Illinois when I started my ministry as a 29-year-old in 1998. Quiet calm, structured, and ordered worship. There was a guy about 83 years old, Elmer, on the search committee that called me. He and I really were good friends, really respected each other, but we did not see eye to eye on things about worship. <laughs> not everything. For example, when I asked the congregation to stand up and greet their neighbor and, and tell them that they were glad to see their neighbor in worship, uh, Elmer pulled me aside after worship that night and said, you know, we had a preacher who tried that here once. <laughs> and when I left the pulpit and preached without notes and walked around in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the sanctuary, he told me after worship, we built that pulpit for a reason. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> And when we had a conversation about worship around the board table or in the worship committee, Elmer would quote his favorite pastor from 1955, Homer Watkins, who would say, if you have to whisper in the sanctuary, whisper a prayer. Is that proper worship? Quiet. As though God is sleeping. <laughs> we don't want to wake him up. <laughs> is that proper worship? The Greek, the biblical word in the New Testament for worship is proskuneo, which literally means to make yourself small in front of. And I suppose all these ways of, of looking at worship, genuflecting, bowing, prostrating, hands held, bowing heads in the sanctuary, that's all a way of humbling ourselves, humbling ourselves, making ourselves small before God. But that's much different than another kind of worship that I discovered working with a good friend from South Korea over the past couple years. He was a member of the church with me, and he had Pentecostalism in his background. And we started a praise band together. And for him, proper worship was standing up, raising your hands, and doing whatever with your hands and your body the Spirit called you to do for as long as it called you to do it. Worship for him was unstructured, experiential. In your worship bulletin, we have these yellow handouts or the inserts. They talk about worship too for some of our church members here. Two testimonies today. Describe what we love about worship here at Central Christian. The first one, if you haven't read it yet, you'll read it later. The first one talks about how we do need a sacred space in the sanctuary. And we love the beauty of this building for the sense of the sacred that it creates and how important it is to step away from our life out there and come in here for rest and respite. And when we're here, as the second one describes, we have been treated to a history of great musicians and great choirs and, and a history of great preachers who brought the word to us in such a way that we have felt God's presence on a regular basis. And I would say that sanctuary worship is a wonderful, wonderful gift from God. God knows that life is hard out there. And God knows that we need to be strengthened for the journey ahead. Just this past 
month in the Christian Century magazine, there was an article about how worship can be that which clothes us, clothes us, and wraps us up in, in kind of a protective clothing so that we can endure the struggles that are out there. I mean, raise your hand right now if you know that life can be hard out there, right? We know that. And so we come here and God gives us this wonderful gift. But here's the thing. If worship is just about what we receive from God, and it doesn't entail any of our giving out from what we have received, then really, we are dying a slow but inevitable spiritual death. Let me see if I can illustrate this. Look at the back of your bulletin. You'll see a picture. It's a picture of the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea. The Dead Sea, as you may know, is the lowest point on earth. It's some, it has some of the saltiest and densest water in the world. But it gives us, an above and beyond that, it gives us a really good spiritual lesson. Being the lowest point on earth, there are two tributaries that feed the Dead Sea. And you can see the first one from the north. It goes straight down. You see that? That's the Jordan River, the river where Jesus was baptized. The Jordan River feeds water into the Dead Sea. And then there's a river to the east in modern-day Jordan. It's called the River Arnon. It feeds water in from the east. So the Dead Sea is taking on all this water, but what, what do you notice is not there? There's no tributary leading out of the Dead Sea. It takes in, it takes in, and takes in, and gives nothing out. And so we say spiritually it's called the Dead Sea for a reason. It's called the Dead Sea for a reason. It accepts all of these tributaries and these gifts, and doesn't put anything back out. And it's the same way for us in our spiritual lives. If we take in, take in, take in, and do nothing with that, and, and it's not given out in some way, we too are dying spiritually. I find it incredibly powerful when we think of the Christian story of salvation, that at every fundamental and important part of that story, God is giving us something. God initiates the story by giving. For example, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, God gives us the gift of life. God gives us creation, this created world to live in. And then a little while later, Genesis 15, when the people that God created were lost and in danger and homeless and threatened and nomadic, God gave us the covenants and said, I will be with you, and I'll give you a home and provide for you my presence and protection. And then a little while later, when the people wondered, God, how do we know that you're with us? God gave them the law through Moses on Mount Sinai. And then when the people invariably, because they were people, strayed away from the law, God gave them the prophets to say, come on back. This is the way you come back home. And when God saw no other way to save the people, God gave us Jesus. And we know that Jesus gave, gave up his life as a gift for us. And during his lifetime with us, at the moment when Jesus gave us his greatest lesson for what life, the life of faith looked like, it wasn't in the temple, it wasn't in the synagogue, it wasn't in the sanctuary, it was in a home around the dinner table when he got up after dinner and put a towel around his waist and knelt down before his neighbors and washed their feet, giving, serving. True worship is about receiving and giving, receiving and serving. And that's why I think what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 today, he says to, to, to live for God is to give for God. We love because God has first loved us. And our response, proper response to all that God has given us is giving. Giving anything. And so I say that for a Russian Orthodox or a visitor to the Holy Land or a Korean praise band leader or an octogenarian from southern Illinois 
or for you or for me. It's all the same. True worship, right worship, has got to have a component of God giving to us, but it needs the component of us giving outward as well, which is why we give. It's obvious. It's why we collect an offering. But much more than that, we give because without our giving, the story of salvation stops. The story of Christ's salvation stops if we receive without putting out. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for all the ways you provide for us and, and pray that we would remember that true, right, faithful worship contains our receiving and our giving as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.